ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Max Forte video. This time a different one. I'm joined today by my friend and special guest, Persa Lays. Uh, thanks for joining me today. We're going to talk about a very cool subject, the 70s. Uh, we're going to talk about the culture, the fashion, the style, the music. And then we're going to talk about our favorite top picks for that decade. And stay tuned because this is going to be a series on this channel, which will cover the 70s today. Then you can look forward to the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and 2010s. Darius, or Persa Lays, I should say. Thanks for joining me today. Not at all. As always, thank you so much for having me, Max. And um, thanks for setting this really, really interesting challenge. I'm very, very curious to see what your choices are going to be. And just so you guys know, we haven't talked about which picks we're going to choose. This was just the idea. The initial, the initial idea was to pick five fragrances each to give you guys a top 10 for that decade. But we don't know what each other are going to pick. So there might be a coincidence here or there. So that's another fun uh, thing that could happen here. Um, Darish. Since you're a little elder to me, um, <laughs> and by the way, and, and by the way, as we record this today, it is my birthday. Uh, but I want you to go first. I want you to tell me a little bit about the decade. I mean, we grew up in the '80s and '90s. You know, I was a teenager in the '90s. You know, I was a kid in the '80s. So the '70s was a little bit ahead of our time, or, or pre, you know, our time. But I definitely saw a lot of the 70s culture into the 80s. But from the research that I that I did, I'm sure you did it as well. What can you tell us about the, the, the 70s cultural phenomenon, the fashion, the, the, the disco music or the style of clothing, the style of fragrances? What can you tell us? First of all, happy birthday, Max. And I'm sure everybody watching, well, by the time this, <laughs> this, this goes out on your channel, it probably won't be your birthday, but they'll be, they'll be sending you belated birthday wishes. It's funny about the 70s, you know, because, um, yeah, I'm slightly older than you. So I still count. I still count as an 80s kid, I think, in terms of um, in terms of TV programs and music and toys and upbringing and that kind of thing. The 80s are my my childhood decade, really. Although I think I do have some memories from the 70s. They would have been memories from when we were living in the south of Iran. But you mentioned the 70s when I was at university and studying film and journalism. Uh, we watched, one of the films that we watched was the Martin Scorsese classic, uh, Taxi Driver, considered to be one of the best films of the 70s, if not one of the best films of all time. And I remember my lecturer at the time saying, oh, look, this is a film from the 70s, the decade that style forgot. And I think, I think our assessment of the 70s has changed a little bit. In the 90s, when I was at university, the 70s were still not seen as being quite cool yet. Whereas now, the 70s are actually seen as being not just cool, but kind of glam, glamorous. You know, Studio 54, Andy Warhol, Yves Saint Laurent, all of that, you know, Blondie, has got a very different feel to it now, a much more um, appealing, alluring feel than it did in the 90s. In the 90s, you kind of were thinking, were thought of the 70s as the decade of really bad trousers, and hair that was too big um, and, you know, really, really dubious taste in interior design. I don't know what the situation was in, in the States, but interior design in the UK, I think in the seventies wasn't great. But now, you know, now we think disco, now we think bold patterns and colors and fabrics. We think lots and lots of classic movies and I want to come back to that later. So. Yes, our assessment of that decade has changed, hasn't it? What about for you? What do, if you had to if you had to sum up the seventies in one sentence? I think two words come to my mind from the research that I did, which would be you know coming from the era of you know all you need is love, peace, you know the sixties, the seventies. What what I came to to fruition in my mind is liberation and anything goes. It's everyone just freeing themselves, you know. Uh, the big froze, the you know the like you said the long hairs, the, the hippie movement, uh, bell bottoms, you know, um, you know you talked about Blondie, but you know Olivia Newton John, Donna Summer, the disco era, Studio Fifty Four, lots of drugs, you know people were doing a ton of drugs. I think Coke became very relevant and, and prolific in, in especially here in the U.S. Um, so, yeah, it was like anything goes and liberation. Everybody wanted to feel free and express their opinions and their voices. Um, yeah, I think that that's that's the kind of the idea that I get. And everything is cyclical in fashion. So we can see a lot of the things that happened in the 70s kind of coming back now a little bit. Totally, totally. Because it's been, well, the, the 70s were about 50 years ago, weren't they? 
uh, which is a scary thought as well. Um, but and that's long enough for things to be able to come back, and but not be seen as being passé. That they can now be seen as being worthy of reappraisal. So it's, it's interesting. Now, when it comes to the fragrance uh, profiles, what do you think were the popular characters uh, that we found in fragrance industries in the 70s and 80s? What, like, two things come to my mind, but I want to hear your thought first. What do you think were the most popular amongst men and women? I think back then the unisex thing wasn't as prominent as we came to find out in the 80s. Um, I think it was still a lot of the macho thing, hair-chested fragrances, mustache, you guys with mustache. Uh, you think like what what profiles of fragrances come to mind for for men and women back then? No, that's an always it's always an interesting question trying to categorize those sorts of things. I mean, I guess for us, our work is made a little bit easier still when you if you think about the seventies, maybe the sixties, because there wasn't such a vast number of perfumes released as you had maybe in the eighties and certainly in the nineties. So so you you can kind of look at the totality of seventies fragrances. You know, during that whole decade, Chanel only released two perfumes. Uh, Stay Lauder, I think, maybe released three. Uh, you know, Dior perhaps released a couple. So so you can really home in and, and think about the output and not be phased by all of these outliers and be distracted by them. I guess there's two things for me. I mean, the 70s were definitely the decade uh, for green scents. Greens completely came into their own. And maybe there was also... It's interesting you say unisex because, no, they weren't unisex perfumes, but maybe there was a kind of movement towards things that were a little bit more androgynous <clears throat> and playing with gender codes in that way after, after the 60s perfumes that were perhaps more clearly delineated in terms of their gender code. So I think that's what I would say, but certainly green. And greens are a hard sell. Like greens didn't really have... Well, greens probably haven't actually had a real moment since the 70s, I don't think. I don't know. I'd have to, I'd, I'd have to consider that one. But that was, that was definitely the decade for greens. Completely agree with you. I think fougere comes to mind. I think uh, fougeres were huge in the 70s, which is, uh, you know, the, just like a Disney world for me, you know, uh, because I love fougeres. So even like putting this list together was so hard because I came up with like, 30 fragrances that I love from that decade. And I had to really narrow it down to the top five, leaving a couple of some of the ones that I love, you know, behind. But I think these are the five that summarize this decade for me, even though I wasn't alive. But I completely agree with you. Green, woody, but but very fougerish. I think lavender and greens were, were definitely uh oak moss. I think oak moss was huge at, at this decade. Um those really hair chested fragrances, and it ported right into the early 80s, which we'll see when we talk about the 80s as well. Uh, but I agree with you. When it comes to, you know, releases, you know, I was looking back and doing the research, you know, 70s, 80s and 90s. I mean, the number of releases from these companies, you could count on two hands, you know, at the most in the 90s. And then when we got into the 2000s, you know, over the past 10 years, you know, the average is like 3000 plus releases per year, which is insane. You know, who could keep track? You know, but let's 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 uh, digress a little bit. Let's talk about the 70s here. Let's start with your picks. Now, again, guys, just so, so you know, the fragrances here that we're going to choose are going to be from January 1st, 1970 until December 31st, 1979. The fragrances have to be within that decade. So, Persolais, why don't you uh, enlighten us with your first pick? And by the way, I'm doing mine chronologically. <laughs> no, if you if you're going chronological, I'll go chronological as well. But I have a question for you before I pick up my first one. How did you go about choosing your five? And what I mean by that is, did you did you try and go for ones which were significant or important at the time? Did you go for ones which are still in existence and still in good shape? I'm just curious about that. Whenever I do picks like this, like because this is my list, so I try to go for fragrances that have the most meaning to me. Uh, and if by chance they have made tremendous impact in the industry, whether they were trendsetter or groundbreaking fragrances, that's just even a plus. But these are near and dear to my heart. These are fragrances that, as you'll see, all of them have a lot of meaning, um, especially two of them. But uh, yeah, I go first how they make me feel and the kind of meaning that they have to me. And then, you know, from the research, you know, I try to, you know, see how impactful they were with the with that particular decade but this is our first time doing this so i'm sure as we progress you know we'll see a lot more uh things to take into consideration but the 70s since we weren't here yet you know i was born late 70s so you know but i love these fragrances dearly and you'll see 
some of these have tremendous relevance to me. How about you? How, how do you uh, how do you narrow no, down? Well, the, the reason why I ask that question is because it is re relevant in a way to this first choice, because one of the perfumes that I was very seriously considering putting on the list, and it's not on the list, is Opium from, from Yves Saint Laurent. Now, now Opium, for, for people who are interested, that came out in 1977. Yeah, Opium 1977 is without a shadow of a doubt a groundbreaking fragrance. Uh, it is not on my pick because I went straight to masculine fragrances stuff that i stuff that i wear but um i mean if you if you put opium there i mean that, that was my mom's signature fragrance for many years and it's certainly a groundbreaking trendsetter fragrance without a shadow of a doubt it's like a hall of fame type of a fragrance well this is going to be good then because i think we have basically inadvertently established that we are not going to overlap on this list because i just went for the five that i thought were the greatest and they are all scents that, as far as the brands were concerned, were marketed as scents for women. So that's interesting. So we've basically got five for the ladies and five for the gents. That's beautiful. So I didn't. I didn't go for opium on the basis, even much as though, much as I love it, on the basis that it really, really current opium really isn't what it used to be. So we're starting with another one from Yves Saint Laurent, but this one is from. Ah, uh, see now that looks like. This is a vintage, this is a vintage parfum opium. This is what my mother used to wear. That's very special. You need to hang on to that one. Absolutely. Stunning. Or you need to give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, 19, 1971 from Yves Saint Laurent. This is a tiny little mini of Rive Gauche. Uh, th and this is actually an old sample. Um, uh, giving it a little bit of context, it was composed by I never know exactly how to pronounce this person's name, but I think it's Michel E, with the E uh, written as H-Y. And Jacques Bolge, who then became Chanel's perfumer, had a lot to do with this as well. Now, I'm going to put some directly on skin with this one because, because it's quite hard to put this one on, on, the, on the blotter. Uh, the, the, the top notes in this particular sample have got a little bit, I think, pickled, we can say, but, but it's... But, as soon as that fades away, it's still intact. And this is, in terms of its structure, for those of you the, who those of you haven't smelt it, it is still made by Yves Saint Laurent. You can still buy it. This is a really, really beautiful um, aldehydic floral, but not aldehydic in the sense of that huge aldehyde powder bomb that you might associate with Chanel Number no. Five. Here, the aldehydes are very much at the service of um, of the florals, and the floral is is mainly a rose, a kind of quite metallic, sharp, playful, charming rose. And another thing that I did, because I'm such a movie buff, I thought it might be quite fun for me to link the five perfumes I've chosen to a classic film from the 70s. And Amazing. This one, this one, this one absolutely had to be Saturday Night Fever because it's got that kind of dressed up feel. It's got the, it's got the disco glam, it, the aldehydes catch the light, you know, so you've got the glitter ball spinning around. And it's got people just enjoying themselves and 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 having a nice time. So that's that's first, 1971. There's another one from 1971, but I'll let you go first. With your... All right. So my first pick is going to be a fragrance that is featured in a 90s movie. I think it's 90s. Because you talked about movies, so I'm a movie buff too. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put that out there. It's in the uh, the medicine cabinet of um, Christian Bale, and it's this fragrance right here. Ah. Uh, Yves Saint Laurent. So we both started with Yves Saint Laurent. This is from 1971, and it's Pohon, the original Pohon. Now, this particular fragrance... Which I love, by the way. Oh, it's so good. The initial blast is a little bit animalistic. There's some kind of a animalistic undertone here um, that could be Savat, if I'm not mistaken. But it also has this gorgeous melange of citruses. And of course, the green base, the, the bedding of that oak moss that we talked about, some lavender here, some spices. I would consider this a woody spicy uh, with some fougere tendencies. And the, the citrics up top, I mean, the citric notes are just so invigorating, but that quickly goes away and leaves you with that green fougere, lavender, barbershoppy kind of a feel. But it's a lot more citrus. What I would, you know, say this fragrance, in 1966, we had Dior Eau Sauvage. So this is like a, a stronger version of Eau Sauvage from Dior. I think they took inspiration from Eau Sauvage from 1966 and made this 
absolutely phenomenal fragrance, which unfortunately I think has been discontinued um, in the 90s, I think. And Eau Sauvage is still available today. Um, and by the way, Eau Sauvage was a fragrance that was very strongly used, not only in the 70s, but also in the 80s. But since it's from 1966, of course, we can't include on this list. But I definitely think, and the reason why I chose this is because I love the scent and it has a lot of similarities to Eau Sauvage, which I do love and could not keep, you know, in this list. So 1971 Prolm uh, from Yves Saint Laurent is definitely an amazing woody spicy slash fougere. Are you familiar with this one? Uh, no, absolutely. It's, it's, it's in my collection. Uh, a few years after they released that one, I think they also did a, a, a concentrated version, didn't they? Which I also like. I love its uh, citrus opening. The, the concentrate... The concentrate has the black uh, cap, yes. which I, I don't own. I, I would love to have a bottle of that. Ah, I've, I've, got, I've got some hidden away somewhere. The story goes with this perfume was that um, it was actually Yves Saint Laurent's own personal perfume. And then because people kept asking him what on earth he was wearing and telling him how good it was, he decided to release it. It, it, it may be true, it may not, I, I don't know. But it's, it's, it's great, it is great. It's, it is one of the great all-time masculines. Um, I think for a while you could still get it through Yves Saint Laurent. I, I'd, I'd have to check that. I don't know whether there is some variant of it that's still available, but no. I, it might be. It might be available on a different collection that they put out as a re-release in the 2010s. I want to say or, or mid 2000s, uh, but that has been discontinued as well. And by the way, the nose behind this one is Raymond Chalon or Chalon, which I don't know much of his works with this humor. He had a hand in making um, opium as well, supposedly. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so so we've got we've got two YSLs, and we've managed to mention opium. It was obviously a good decade for them. For both. <laughs> <laughs> All right, your turn. Uh, well, I'm still with 1971, and actually, I think this is not just one of the greatest perfumes of the 70s, but also one of the greatest perfumes of all time. Uh, we've mentioned the brand already, so this is, let me, let's do this the right way, this is Chanel number no. 19. This is a, a very special, to me, uh, bottle of Chanel number no. 19. This is the Parfum, and I managed to pick it up at wow. uh, an antiques market uh, in Japan. In case anybody's watching and you're not aware of this, Japan is a superb place to pick up old, old vintage, untouched perfumes. Um, I've used it very, very sparingly. Um, number 19 was made by Henri Robert, who was making all of... Um, oh, look, and the spray mechanism isn't working, Max. No, here we go. Uh, who was making all of Chanel's perfumes at the time. He also, a few years after this one, made Cristal, which, again, is, is just an extraordinary scent. I actually did a video about it on my channel just the other day. And, oh, are you familiar with number 19? <laughs> Yeah, I don't have good as a version as you do. I have a Eau de Parfum version, uh, which is yeah. a lot newer. Uh, so I know it's not going to be anything as good as yours because it's not vintage or anything. No, I, I, I brought the EDP, actually. You've reminded me. I may as well put that here just to kind of keep this display going. I got the EDP as well. Now, the EDP would have been made probably in the... In, I'd need to check the dates, but it probably would have been made in the 80s, maybe early 90s when the brand started making more... EDPs, it would have originally come out as an EDT and a Parfum, which was standard procedure for most releases then. This is this is a green floral. So if, if Rive Gauche is an aldehydic floral, this is, uh, it's, it's got a floral heart of flowers that you might associate with maybe slightly angrier sensibilities you know things that have a bit more of an edge so hyacinths you know hyacinths can sometimes feel a little bit cold uh, a, a little bit of sharp breath. sharp exactly and it's got th th that's very very definitely got this kind of vibe with a tremendously green green super green opening at the top thanks to the use of a massive dose of galbanum and I think it's this coldness and this greenness and this sharpness that has caused a lot of people to see Chanel number no. 19 as being quite off-putting and quite standoffish. 
you know, describing it in not always in very complimentary terms. Whereas I've always liked to think of it as being quite formal and businesslike, you know, so not the kind of perfume that you're on first name terms with straight away. I actually think that there's a lot in here as well that's quite tender and gentle and romantic once you get past that initial coldness. So to go back to my film analogy, I thought that this would make a good pairing with the classic Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie movie, Don't Look Now. Do you remember the one about when they lose their child and they go, well, amazing film if you haven't seen it. I haven't it's seen fun. it. Ah, oh, now the thing about that movie is that it's got, it's, it's full of emotion because it's all about grief and bereavement and it's got lots and lots of very tender and very explicit scenes of marital love and marital intimacy, but it has also got a very, very scary, creepy edge to it. And so that's why it's a, it's a perfect match, I think, with number 19. So that's my second choice, just it's, extraordinary perfume. It's funny you say that. I, I'm gonna steal a quote from, are you familiar with Katie Puckrick? She is from the channel, uh, yeah, Katie Puckrick yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Tremendous reviewer here on YouTube, yeah. uh, you know, and, she said something that I thought was really uh, smart and, and very eloquent. You know, it was fun and witty. She said that, you know, people so always say, you know, the devil wears Prada even became a movie with, uh, with um, Meryl Streep. Uh, Meryl Streep, thank you. Yeah. And she's like, the devil may wear Prada as far as clothes, but he's definitely spraying Chanel number no. 19 as his perfume. I thought it was was quite ingenious and fun, and I and I wanted to steal that quote here and and, and put it out there. So I, I know exactly what you're saying. I love the fragrance, but I can see, especially in the beginning, Chanel 19 can be sharp and a little bit off-putting. But as it progresses, that that labdanum, the green creaminess, the florals just just blends to this beautiful melange that is just very uncanny and just particular to this fragrance. So I know what you're saying. It's a great scent. Um, Speaking of green, I'm going to go with a very, very green scent. I mean, this whole decade was pretty much around the green like we talked about. But as you'll see, I have such a, a big hankering for fougeres. It's, it is my favorite you know, genre. So I think most of my picks will be kind of fougerish. Um, and this here looks like a microphone. Ladies and gentlemen, here it comes. I'm trying to see what it is. Fly me to the moon. This is going to be Pierre Cardin Port Monsieur from 1972. Oh, wow. Yes. Um, so this particular fragrance here, just for reference here, if some of you younger people out there maybe haven't had the pleasure to try this, it's some still of us, available. Some of us older people haven't had the pleasure either. I'm curious about this one. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a microphone. It's still available today, by the way. Uh, this is an older formulation from the 80s, but if you, you pick up, it was released in 1972, so also from the beginning of the decade. And what this reminds me of, and I know for a fact Tom Ford in his private blend took inspiration from this fragrance here in another fragrance that I'm going to talk about later as an honorable mention. He wanted to combine both fragrances with the florals and the greens to come up with a fragrance called Moss Bresh from the private blends, which I also have uh, behind me. So this is a very green, herbal, spicy fougere. But it, what I love about it is that it has this very particular honey kind of uh, nuance to it that's also creamy and sweet that kind of like tames that, that you know, hair chestedness that you get from the fougeres that people normally sell. That's for my grandfather. He used to wear that. My, 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 you know, my father used to wear that. I don't want to wear that. I want something that's, you know, young and sweet. But this has a little bit of that sweetness with the honey. But it, it also keeps that fougere that we're talking about here, the green, the earthy, but I think it's a little bit tame because of that, that honey accord. Maybe there's some sandalwood here in the base as well. I love this stuff. It is a heavy scent, though. It is a heavy scent, especially in the beginning. So this is called Port Monsieur from Pierre Cardin, 1972. Are you, so have you ever tried this one? Uh, if I have, then I've forgotten. I mean, I may well have tried it in the 80s or something. But no, that's not one that I'm familiar with at all, really. It's really wow. good. Amazing. Amazing. And also has a little bit of an aldehylic feel as well. Um, kind of like the stuff that you would find. I don't know who the nose behind this one is, but it, it has a little bit of a Chanel-esque feel to it, especially in the heart, you know, from the heart on into the dry down. You get a little bit of aldehydic kind of a feel. That's amazing. I shall, I shall have to see if I can try and find a few drops. What would be your third choice? Well, I'm just going one year ahead actually this is 1972 so you've just had a 1972 as well haven't you 
but but this bottle here is very definitely a more recent bottle so this is a this is a kind of current ish formulation of a 70s classic and this is i don't know if you can see there let me hold it up so the name can be seen this is diorella from from dior uh obviously it was originally composed by uh, edmond rudnitska who of course did um au sauvage and fans of Luca Turin and Tania Sanchez and their guide may be aware that uh, they in their guide reckon that Durella is like a sort of perfected version of Eau Sauvage. And if you, if you smell Eau Sauvage and Durella, you, you, you completely see what they mean. Uh, Durella was marketed as a scent for, for women, um, but there's absolutely no reason why it can't be worn by a guy because in terms of its structure, it completely is uh, a sort of, you know, citrus at the top, wood in the base, with a very sheer, transparent, watery, dewy, floral heart in the same way that you've got that kind of very pale, beautiful, soft, tender jasmine heart in the, in, in, in the centre of Eau Sauvage. This is doing exactly the same thing in terms of its structure, but maybe it's just a tiny little bit sweeter and maybe more sheep like rather than just purely woody in the base. Um, it's a classic, classic citrus sheep. Uh, if people uh, are aware of Eau de Magnolia from Frederick Mal, that's very definitely taken its inspiration from Diorella. I mentioned Cristal from Chanel. They all share the, the, the same DNA sparkling sparkling gorgeous you know champagne bubble citrus notes at the top and a really androgynous quality we were talking about androgynous qualities in 70s perfumes which is why to link it up with a movie this one for me is Woody Allen's Annie Hall because the the Annie Hall character of course has an androgynous quality about her she you know she she likes mixing things up with the clothes that she wears and this perfume is charming a little bit quirky it's definitely got a melancholy in its soul in there somewhere but it's fun it's vibrant um and this is the one that i've actually been wearing today and madame Persolais, otherwise known as my wife kept sort of coming up to me saying well, what is this what is this you know it smells amazing on you and i said well it's a 70s perfume for today's video with max um so i would recommend checking it out this is the Eau Toilette version, and I think it is now only available as an EDT from Dior, which is actually fine because the fact that it's an EDT suggests that it's as close as they've been able to make it to Edmund Rudnitzka's original formula. So Diorella from, from Dior. From 1972. Yes. My pick is from 1973. Now this fragrance here, very dear and near to me because it used to be my father's, still is, he's still alive. It's his signature scent. Whenever he wants to smell amazing or you know, something that he picks up and without thinking, this is his signature scent and it's Paco Rabanne Pour Homme. Oh, wow. This this is a vintage bottle. Wow. Um, and I find myself there or, or personalized over the years now really uh, liking the notes. I'm trying to find the blotter here. Uh, the note of honey in my fragrances. And this fragrance has the green, the fougere aspect to it, but it also has this really nice... Give me one second here. Couldn't find the blotter, <laughs> so I'm going to get a new one. Uh, yeah, so this is a fougere at heart, but it has a lot of spices, some cinnamon, gorgeous honey accord. Um, it has a little bit of a green tinge to it. even has a little bit of, um, reminds me a little bit of, of Chanel number 19, but it goes into a different direction. It goes into this a lot stronger and more powerful macho kind of a vibe. Um, clary sage, rosemary. So there's a lot of um, herbal components here. It sounds very 70s, actually. I it's, mean, I, I, I'm sure I would have worn this in the 80s. I may even have like a tiny little mini stashed so away good. somewhere. This is so good. This reminds me of my childhood, me stealing sprays from my dad. Um, <laughs> It's got Brazilian rosewood, uh, geranium, lavender, so it has that barbershop soapy feel. Um, I don't know, I just love it. The, the oak moss, the honey, and the, most, and the musk in the base gives the most animalistic feel to it. But again, I, I find myself loving these fragrances with honey. I, I think it adds this, this 
really beautiful touch to the fragrances. This is a masterpiece. Uh, the nose behind this one is Jean Martel, or Jean, Jean, Jean Martel. I hope I'm not butchering his name. I know it's French. Um, are you familiar with the works of, of Jean Martel? The name definitely, I'd have to check my notes. I mean, absolutely, the name rings a bell, but I'd need to go and see. But at, at, at the moment, off the top of my head, I can't think of what else he may have done. But one thing about Paco Rabanne Pohom is that it starts really rough and, and you know, rough and tumble, you know, very, you know, hair chested, but it gets smoother and soapier, you know, after like the first hour or two, it becomes more uh, bearable, you know, just like Kuros, for example. But it does have the musk, you know, animalistic feel to it. It does have the beautiful woods, the, the spiciness, the herbal feel. I love it. I think it's amazing. My wife's not a big fan of these fragrances, so <laughs> I, I have to wear them very gingerly, but sometimes I get sentimental. I, you know, I get these uh, very urges to wear fragrances that remind me of my father or my childhood, and I don't care. I, I bathe myself in this stuff. But it, it's great. 1973 Paco Rabanne Pohon. I think it's it's another classic that mu must be checked out if you haven't. The, the current formulation is a lot tamed. You know, you're, th you're talking maybe... 50% of what the fragrance was. It's a lot more wearable, I guess, to conform to, to, to nowadays, you know, taste. And, you know, they claim that they can't use uh, the elements, of course, you know, the, the animalistic notes, the, you know, the glands of the animals, I'm sure they can't use those anymore. So they, they try to capture the essence as much as possible. I want to say it's about 50% of, of the strength and the power that this fragrance had on its original form. Are you familiar? Uh, as I say, I, I probably would have worn that in the 80s. And I may I need to dig out my stash of old the little minis somewhere because I probably have a few drops of that somewhere. But but that was a it was a range that did very well, didn't it? Because then there was like a Pacaraban um, sport sport. And, you know, the, the, yeah, it, it did very well for them, that line, I think. Yeah. Still around today. It goes to show, you know, mm, mm, still in yes. production. Yeah. Yeah. What is your next pick? I am um, moving ahead a few years now, actually, because we're going right to 1978 and uh, an all time uh, American classic. This one, very, very important American perfume. Estee Lauder had a very good decade uh, in the 70s, but this one, this one trumps them as far as I'm concerned. This is White Linen from Estee Lauder, composed by Sophia Groisman. I think we can safely call her the legendary Sophia Groisman. Um, as it, as it, just so happens, I did a whole video on this over on my channel, just on white linen. Um, I've put these two next to each other because in terms of their structure, they could both be called aldehydic florals. But whereas I said that Rive Gauche is an aldehydic floral with the emphasis on the florals, which makes it different from Chanel number no. five, white linen actually is very comparable to Chanel number no. five. So in white linen, you do get that powder puff cloud burst of aldehydes that feel like a sort of cross between candle wax and champagne bubbles. Um, and actually cl clouds, clouds are, are, are a great description, you know, for people who love Chanel number no. five and Chanel number no. 22, they'll know exactly what I mean. Everything feels very, very sparkling and powdery. Um, really, really dense uh, floral heart, but even though it's dense, full of a, a bouquet of flowers. So you could probably pick out any flower you want here. You could probably pick out, you know, sweet peas and freesias and honeysuckle and lilac and rose and jasmine. Even though it is dense, it never becomes cloying or overpowering. I mean, this is a, a, a masterpiece of balance. And Sophia Groisman also was really, really great in her use of musks. She became quite famous for her use of musks, um, uh, notably in uh, Paris for YSL, uh, Eternity for Calvin Klein, in a real, real classic sense, uh, Trésor for Lancôme. And it's that that interplay between the aldehydes and the florals and the musks that makes white linen so special because it somehow manages to smell of what it's called. You know, you, 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 you picture a beautifully clean, crumpled white linen, and yet somehow it seems to be really, really colorful as well. In terms of pairing it up with a movie, this is the one I struggled with. But in the end, I decided to go for um, uh, American Graffiti, the, the, the George Lucas film before he made um, Star Wars, because it's got a, a very nostalgic feel to it. It's, 
it's uh, uh, it's it's an all American movie. You know, it's about American high schools. In some ways, it's kind of considered to be the the prototype of the American high school teen movie. And it's all about looking back and innocence uh, and and looking to the past with longing and nostalgia. So that's why I thought American Graffiti and White Linen might make a good pairing. But that's the fourth one, White Linen from Estee Lauder. That's awesome. So this next fragrance here encompasses my childhood. It reminds me of just like Paco Rabanne. It reminds me of the early 90s because, believe it or not, people, like, like we talked about, there weren't many fragrances being released, you know, at that point. Every company maybe had one or two tops per year. Um, and people that had, you know, the idea of wearing this fragrance were people that were very well off. Uh, financially. I remember lawyers wearing this fragrance. I remember people I used to golf wearing this fragrance. And I always wanted to have a bottle for myself, you know. It was released in 1978, but it it, it will it, it was a top seller and a fragrance that was viewed as a status symbol well into the uh, 80s and 90s. And I think it's going to make sense when I show you this. This is a very bold and powerful fragrance. We talked about you know, the devil wears Prada, but he, he might, you know, spray a few spritz of Chanel number no. 19. But I think he might actually wear this. I'm talking about oh, polo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if we're talking about powerful, pungent leather, pine needles, um, tobacco, there's a very harsh note of tobacco here. Uh, in the beginning, it's not going to be for everyone. I know people that hate the smell of this fragrance. I absolutely love it. I think I think that the tobacco here is very leafy. Uh, it's 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 a little bit wet. Um, tons of green notes, some leather, like skanky rough and tumble leather. Definitely oak moss. Tons of spices. I get some cinnamon here. Perhaps some nutmeg. How old is your bottle? Uh, this is a Cosmere bottle from the late nineties. Okay. Um, I'm fortunate to have a couple. I think I have three bottles altogether from the 90s. Uh, like I said, you know, the sooner I could get a little bit of money when I started working, I picked up a couple of bottles of this because I always wanted to have a bottle. Um, my parents didn't particularly like the smell. My father didn't wear this. My mother didn't wear this. Uh, so as soon as I could pick up a bottle, because I, I remember, man, I remember lawyers, you know, dressed to the T with three piece suit wearing this fragrance. And I remember as a kid asking, hey, sir, what are you wearing? I was like, I'm wearing a polo a rough war. It's a green bottle. It's like, man, I can't wait to get money to, to buy this because it's got this really, I can't describe, but because I think I saw a lot of people that had status wearing this fragrance. So I, I link it to status. I link it to success. And when I smell this, that's what comes to my mind. It comes to, you know, it, it makes me feel successful. It makes me feel, um, you know, accomplished, if you will. So this to me is a CEO, a boss, you know, uh, I, I never seen women wearing this fragrance. I'm sure you can if you want. If you're women out there, you're listening to this. Of course, you can wear. There's no gender in, in, in fragrances, but this is a very rough, skanky leather, pine needles and tobacco type of a fragrance. Are you familiar with this one? I was, but you know, I have not smelt it for the longest time. And <laughs> again, I need to see if I, I, because I think I may have even mentioned uh, this on your channel, Max, when you were kind enough to interview me about my tiny little shoebox of samples that my mum looked after for me. And I wonder if there's uh, an old polo in there. I know there's um, a safari in there, you know, another uh, uh, Ralph Lauren. Um, From yeah, the 90s. Was, yes, but but this was, this was, polo was still huge, 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 huge in the 80s, wasn't this, it? This fragrance here, if I may so, if I may say so, this fragrance, I think, put Ralph Warren in the world of, of fashion and, 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 you know, in fragrances, you know, this was a staple, a statement type of a fragrance. And I think this fragrance opened the doors for, for Ralph Warren, you know, uh, I think, you know, because of this fragrance, he became an icon, a fashion icon uh, for the United did, States. Did you manage to find out, because I'm just going to look it up here. I could be completely uh, saying the wrong thing, but I think that was made by Carlos Benaim, wasn't it? Or Carlos was Benaim, 100%. Yeah. Carlos Benaim. Yeah, yes. yeah, because I remember um, I've only uh, been fortunate enough to meet him once to interview him. And actually, it was it was at the launch of, of something from Dunhill. And he was still very happy to talk about polo and because he's, he's so touched by how 
successful it was and 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 you know how influential it was absolutely yeah one thing i want us to do eventually too and and i hope that you're up for it maybe we do a series after we do these decades and we wrap it up you know we talk about hall of fame fragrances you know um I think I think this is a Hall of Famer right here. You know, uh, yep. this was so groundbreaking and so different and unique from anything else up to this point. You know, kudos to Carlo Benaim. I mean, this is this is a masterpiece. You know, no, very, very, very massively, hugely successful, very powerful fragrance. Uh, what is your second to last? I'm very curious. No, it's the last one now, Max. This is number five. Oh, that's right. I gave yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. You started. That's correct. Yeah, that's yeah, correct. yeah. This is this is it. And this takes us to, it's, it's quite fitting in a way that it's worked out like this, because this is the last one, because we've gone chronologically, it's 1979. But I do also actually happen to think that this is the greatest perfume of the 70s, in my humble opinion. And I think it's just one of the most stunning perfumes ever made. Uh, if there are any regular fans from my channel watching this on your channel, they kind of probably have already worked out where I'm going with this. Now, this is a very special bottle that I was able to find a while ago. So the perfume in question is called Naema from Garlin, and it was composed by uh, Jean-Paul Garlin. It was a huge flop when it was released, wow. uh, a huge, huge flop for them. A, a lot of people have lots of different theories as to why it was a huge flop. Some people think that actually it had nothing to do with the perfume at all, that it was just very poorly marketed, etc., etc. But um, over the years, its status just um, rose and rose, its stature rose, and it's now considered to be perhaps the greatest rose perfume ever made, oh. and and certainly one of the greatest from, from Gallin. This is, um, it, it's, it's still around. Uh, it's gone through different bottles, the way a lot of perfumes have gone through different bottles of Gallin. At the moment, I believe it's available only as an eau de parfum, it's not possible for them to make the uh, the pure perfume, the extra anymore, because uh, the, Thierry Vasser, the in-house perfumer at Garland, told me in, in, in an interview once that he has not been able to make it in a form that is satisfactory to him while, uh, while adhering to anti-allergen standards and regulations. And so the line was, if we can't make a good enough version of the Naima extra, then we better just not make it at all which is a, it, it's a crying shame. Now this is, oh, I've, I've talked about them a, a lot on, 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 on my channel. And I always go, each time when I smell it, I always go for the same image. The opening is just one of the most astonishing openings of a perfume I have ever experienced. It's like this vortex of ingredients that pulls you in with every single facet of rose that you could ever think of. So if you think that rose essence has got Peppery, milky, creamy, woody, jammy, apricotty, honey, facet. It's all just kind of draws you in into this most in astonishing, incredible rose you could you could conceive of. Um, and then the storm calms down and, and everything settles and you get this very, very baroque, very grand, very operatic, very opulent, beautiful rose, beautiful use of musks. And it's because of all of the, and I think it's because of the drama and the stately quality of it um, and the, the operatic quality of it that made me pair it up with the classic Stanley Kubrick movie, um, Barry Lyndon. I don't know if you've ever seen Barry Lyndon. I need to rewatch Barry Lyndon actually. But everything in Barry Lyndon is very, very deliberately paced. There is a tremendous amount of attention to detail in Barry Lyndon, you know, the costumes, the lighting, the settings. It, it, and so, I think it's the, the 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 grandiose baroque quality of that that makes me pair it up with this. But it's just amazing. It's one of Madame Perselet's um, signatures. In fact, if there, she she probably has two, but and, and this is absolutely one of them. It's just stunning. And anybody who is in any way, shape, or form interested in rose perfumes has to try this. It's incredible. I love your picks, and I love the fact that without planning, um, we went two different ways, which I, I think I think people will appreciate because you're having a little bit of everything here. Uh, and since you said, you know, if, if your fans, the people that watch your, your channel regularly kind of knew that that was coming, by the way, I have never tried that. So I'm definitely going to procure a bottle because I'm very curious to, to try that. You know, if people follow my channel for any length of time, they'll know what's coming. You know, <laughs> as you said, you think this is definitely the best of the 70s. 
this next one to me is the best of the seventies. Um, and I love Fougeres. I love barbershops. So I couldn't do this list without this fragrance. Oh, I, I knew that would come up. Azara, of course. Yes. <laughs> I knew, I knew you would go for Azara. <laughs> I love that fragrance. Um, and here, I mean, that's a vintage bottle. I have a ton wow. of, I mean, if you saw how many Azaros I have through the decades, you'd say, you'd say I'm crazy, but because, you know, I remember that this was my first real experience with the fragrance. I was seven years old. I think I was in first grade or second grade. And I remember dousing myself with a little mini that I stole from my dad from, that came with a, with a gift gift set. And I had to be removed from class because I was atomic. I was nuclear with, with, with the Azaro, you know, the green, the fougere, the, the earthiness. And people couldn't stand. Like people next to me was like, no, no, no you know, I got a headache. And. I was removed from class and almost sent home. You know, I went outside for a couple hours and once it toned down, you know, the teacher said, okay, come back inside. But, uh, you know, I just, the reaction that I saw on people just made me think, wow, you know, fragrance is a powerful thing. And from that point on, I became en enamored with fragrances and this particular one, uh, you know, was one of my favorite. This is a newer, actually from 1992, this bottle here, but it still retains the quality of this beautiful fougere. I mean, if you love barbershop fragrances, it's still available today. I want to say it's maybe about 50% of what the fragrance used to be. You know, the animalistic notes are no longer here. The fougere here is a lot, I mean, the oak moss is a lot toned down. This is absolutely stunning. I mean, it starts off screaming, green, earthy, herbal, spicy, caraway, fougere, you know, oak moss, lavender. There's a little bit of a leather facet here also, which reminds me a little bit of, of Polo Green, but it's a lot more aromatic. It's not as, as, as rough as Polo Green starts, but it's also very powerful. It's another powerful statement type of a fragrance. To me, it's a masterpiece barbershop. You know, if, if I had to put like the, the top five barbershops of all time, this would definitely make it. Uh, I love it. I love what it does on my skin, you know. People know me for this fragrance as well as Dolce & Gabbana Pour Homme, you know, the original, uh, which I think I have several bottles now. So th this is a statement uh, fragrance. It's a groundbreaking trendsetter. They took the fougere genre and I think they amped it up uh, a few notches. And it has a knees here, which makes it really intriguing and different from a lot of the fougeres that I own. That, that a knees gives it this really oriental, the word that you don't like to use, but it gives this really nice... Um, spicy and seductive feel to the fragrance. I find this very sensual. Uh, if you can get past the first hour, it gets really, really nice. Are you familiar with the Zaru? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, all time classic. It's interesting, before we started recording, you know, when you told me that it's your, your birthday today, I told you that actually one of my oldest, dearest friends, his birthday was, was yesterday, the day prior. And I remember when we were both growing up, both teenagers, his one of his favorites was was you know to him that was like the ultimate per you you didn't need to have any other sense because once you had a Zaro, that was it everything else paled in comparison so it's kind of interesting that it's one of your favorites i have i have a bottle in my collection my bottle sadly isn't that old although i think it's probably getting on a bit now um no i mean huge hugely uh, important classic scent um Gerard, Gerard Anthony is, is the nose behind it. Yes, apparently so. I mean, again, I'd have to, 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 to look up to see what, what else he did. But, but um, it's fascinating, isn't it? That, okay, you're saying that the, the, the current version isn't, isn't quite the same as it used to be, but it's still around. And isn't it, isn't it interesting that these, these perfumes are still known? You know, white linen is still such an important seller for Lauder. Uh, Chanel number no. 19 is still such a, an important part of Chanel's lineup. You know, some of the ones that you mentioned are still going strong. Um, I think that's a testament to to the to the perfume work that was being carried out in the in the 70s by some very, very talented people. And that's a great point. And I want to leave this as a question here to people watching this 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 top video today, because this is a lot more than just your average top video. I think we we took you on a journey. Uh, of fragrances throughout this decade that we absolutely love. And it's a decade that's a really real statement in the world of fragrances. I want you to, you know, comment below. Why do you think these fragrances are still available today? Do you think these companies need to keep these fragrances around? Or do you think this is a true testament of loyalty to people like me, like, like, like Darius or people older now 
but still love these fragrances and would hate to see them go because obviously most companies are catering to younger crowds these days and they certainly wouldn't have to keep these around. Wouldn't you say so, uh, Persilais? Well, I guess if they are keeping them around, it means that they're still managing to generate a profit out of them. Um, but but it is an interesting question. It, it is an interesting question, you know, uh, uh, of, of why some of them have stuck around. I don't think there are quite as many from the 60s that have stuck around. Uh, it would be an interesting one to consider. But um, no, it was it was a good time for perfume creation, maybe because there wasn't as much pressure to release so many. I mean, as, as we said at the top of the video, in that whole decade, Chanel released two perfumes. I mean, just the thought, just the thought of a Amazing. massive major brand like that releasing only two perfumes in a whole decade is, is ridiculous. That means that, that perfumer had all the time in the world to go testing things, tweaking, perfecting, finessing until it was it was just right. I mean, you know, I think I think you'd be you'd be impressed if a brand released only two in one year at the moment. I mean, Guerlain, I think sometimes on average released two a month. Well, the problem is, and we can talk about this in a different video, I think the most problem is the issue of flankers, which became really um, something that people look forward to. You know, they want flankers of all sorts. They want EDPs, EDTs, colognes, eau fraiche, uh, parfum, you know, so it became a, a cash cow, literally. Mm. Uh, and companies are becoming a little lazy, if you will. You know, it's just an easy thing for them to do. You know, it's the same bottle. It's essentially a different label. And, and you know, on we go. Um, but I think back then, like you said, th there wasn't this this pressure or this because these fragrances were so amazing. They did so well for them. And the culture was different. You know, we're, we're in a different culture. We're in a social media culture. You know, people are always, you know, starving and thirsty for, for something new all the time. Uh, especially younger generations. But again, conversation for a different video, but a very interested one. Uh, if you guys, you know, have anything to say about that, please let me know. Let, you know, Persolais know, which I want to shout out Persolais channel. I think uh, it's criminally, you know, underrated to have the, the, the subscribers he has. This is an amazing channel, tremendous knowledge. You guys, please, you know, people that are Max Forte subscribers, please, I want you to pour into Persolais' channel. You're going to love his, his live, uh, you know, videos that he does, which is very... Um, it brings the community together. You know, it, it gets a sense of belonging. People can ask questions. They can talk. It's a lot of fun. It's He's quirky. I love his style. And, you know, I urge you guys to go subscribe to his channel and, and be part of the Personal Ace family as well. Max Forte family, please uh, join his channel. You'll make me very happy. And you certainly make him very happy because he deserves it. So why don't you leave your, your handles? Because you also have a blog because you, you write some stuff about fragrances as well. Absolutely. The blog is the main thing. It's very, very kind of you to say that, Max, and, 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 and to be generous with uh, mentioning the channel. We are, we, are a, we are a tight knit, but very, very friendly uh, group of fragrance aficionados over there on the, on the per Persolais YouTube channel. But yes, the blog is where things started. The blog is now coming up to 11 years old, uh, hundreds and hundreds of perfume reviews over there on the blog. And hopefully we will have you over on my YouTube channel as well soon. <laughs> For a live interview, I tend to do I don't I tend to do things live. You go more for the recorded videos. I like the interaction with the live audience, and I'm going to think of some quirky ideas and topics and and perfume challenges to do with you, so that we can present each other with some favorites in a different way. So maybe by the time this video has been edited and been released by you, we may already even have done one of the the live ones on my channel. But yes, if you've come over from Max's channel, you're more than welcome. It'll be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to those lives. You know, I, I do well with live audiences. That's why I do Scent Explore. I love, you know, seeing people, meeting them in person. And I'm very excited. I, I like doing things sometimes, you know, just on the moment. I, I, I work good like that on pressure. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, this was a great era. It was a lot of fun talking to you. We're kind of coming up an hour here. You know, it goes to show that, you know, time flies when you're having fun. I could literally talk fragrances with you for hours. Um, you know, and, and thank you so much for joining me. It was great pleasure. Uh, this video will be up very soon. I'm going to edit. And I think uh, from the time we're, we're filming it, I'm thinking uh, by the end of this week, I'll have it up for us. And again, guys, tune in again to see the the, the, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000, 2010. It's a five part, you know, five episode series. I think you guys will have a great fun as we take you through the decades. You know, personally, thanks for being here. Hope you have a great rest of your day and I look forward to, to more content with you and doing other things, you know, together because I think uh, there's definitely something special here to offer to these folks.
It is 100% my pleasure. Thank you very much, Max. And I've had a great time sharing these perfumes with you as well. Thanks so much for tuning in, guys. As always, wear what truly moves you. We'll see you guys again very soon. Take care. Thank you.